I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 10. Romans, chapter 10. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 as we get underway. And the title of this sermon is God's Righteous Salvation. Romans 10 and verses 1 through 10. Follow along as I read. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's add verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The salvation offered by a loving God to every sinner is based on a standard of absolute sinless perfection. Uh, if your life uh, can be summarized that way, that is, you've never sinned in thought, word, or deed, you might make it into heaven. The Jews gave answer back to Moses, Deuteronomy 6.25. They said, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Well, they had great uh, hopes. They had great intentions, but they were unable to fulfill them. But if your life cannot be summarized that way, and the Bible's telling us the truth, and we don't have any doubts here, there's a fiery hell waiting for you, and, and no man can escape it. The marvelous theme of God's salvation is that Jesus Christ has satisfied all of the elements of perfection that a holy God requires. And uh, his victory over sin can then be credited to the sinner by an act of faith. This is the easiest time in the history of the world for a sinner to be reconciled to God to be saved right now. The Bible says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and lastly, received up into glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 The Lord Jesus Christ was God in human form, living among men, uh, walking, uh, walking among men so he can identify with men. But unlike men, the Lord Jesus had no sins of his own that needed to be forgiven. He, had, he achieved what men cannot achieve by living a perfect life. The, the New Testament tells us not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. It's the Holy Ghost that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner. Acts 10, verse 38 declares, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Simon Peter later wrote of Christ, And he was an eyewitness, who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15. Christ asked his accusers, Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? John 8, verse 46. He was so sure of his own virtues, he asked them to cite some example where he had broken the law or violated the commandments. And they never did. They never could. It's been suggested that because the Lord Jesus had a divine nature that he could not sin. It was impossible for him to sin. We have to reject that idea. If the Lord Jesus could not sin, then he didn't achieve any victory over sin, did he? If he could not sin, then he wasn't tempted in all points like as we are. If he, if he could not sin, if it, if it was impossible for him to sin, then he cannot identify with you. He can't identify with me. So we reject that idea. We read, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. The Apostle John writes, And every man that hath this hope in him, that's the hope of a new body, purifieth himself even as he is pure. 1 John 3, verse 3. God's standard is sinless perfection that was met and attained by the Lord Jesus Christ. The total worth of that achievement uh, is what we call the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Its quality, its total valuation is what God requires to uh, admit a sinner into heaven. Christ satisfied that standard, and God the Father uh, accepts nothing less. Nor should he. In the song, Christ Receiveth Sinful Men, we sing, um, Now my heart condemns me not, pure before the law I stand. He who cleansed me from all spot, satisfied its last demand. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied the requirements, the demands of the laws of Moses and the laws of God like no man has ever done or ever could do. But the world isn't used to anything or anyone who is that completely flawless and impeccable. Someone who never had to apologize for his words. No, someone who never had to take back his words. Someone who never uh, deliberately tried to cause offense or then lie about his talents or his abilities. People do that. They exaggerate their own abilities quite a bit. But Christ is the standard of God's righteous salvation. I want to call a few, uh, point out a few things to your attention as we go. First of all, notice Paul's passion concerning it. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He didn't desire for them to have more culture or to have more religion or, he, or to even be delivered from uh, Roman dominion. But his desire was that they would be saved. He would later write to the weak, became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that by all means I might save some. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. He wanted all men to be saved, but especially his own countrymen especially his fellow Jews. It's sad that many believers, once they get saved, they don't form and ask God to shape in them the, the driving desire that their own family members would be saved or that their own nationality. Don't be embarrassed by your ethnicity or your nationality. At a, about 10 years ago, my wife and I, it was our anniversary and I was working for us, and during the day, I met a lady and a young woman. She I happened to mention it was our anniversary. And she said, really? Um, you know, I want to get married someday. What advice would you give to someone like me so I don't make any mistakes when I get to that point? And I said, well, no one's ever asked me that before. But I would suggest to you, find somebody who's as much like you as possible. 
someone with the same politics as you have, someone who has the same spiritual and, and religious convictions that you have, and uh, don't be embarrassed to find somebody who's uh, the same uh, ethnicity as you. Don't be embarrassed by that. The world tells you you're supposed to be embarrassed if you say, I'm a white person, I like white people. Or I'm a Korean, I like Korean people. Ignore the world. God made you a certain way, be proud of it. And, and that should drive you to want to see other people like yourself, your family members, come to Jesus Christ. The greatest Christian who ever lived certainly had that desire. And look what he said back in chapter 9 and verses 1 through 5. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Paul was burdened that his own countrymen um, had taken the law and the promises and the blessings of God for granted, and couldn't see that those things were pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is what the nation of Israel longed for and needed. And Paul had a passion that God's righteous salvation would become theirs. Secondly, notice Israel's ignorance of it, verses 2 and 3. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, that righteousness is embodied in Jesus Christ, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Under this second point of Israel's ignorance, let me call to your attention four mistakes the Jews made concerning the righteous salvation of God. First of all, they had zeal without knowledge, as verse 2 has it. People can have a lot of religion, but not have anything real. They can be zealous and excited about things that don't matter a hill of beans. And uh, that's a diversionary tactic offered by Satan to get their minds off the real need of their own soul. Uh, during the week, I worked for a funeral home, as most of you know, and yet I've been at this for, well, the better part of uh, 32 years. And I've seen a lot of things and witnessed a lot of things and have a lot of stories to tell, some of them really humorous as well. So <laughs> I put the fun back in funeral. But yesterday I had to work a, a Mormon funeral. And we get out to the cemetery and the Mormons uh, usually call upon somebody to dedicate the grave. That's going to really change things, right? To dedicate the grave. And it's usually somebody who claims he has the holy Melchizedek priesthood, which gives him the authority to bless things, or I suppose curse things as well. But I saw something really humorous yesterday, and this fellow, he takes out his cell phone, and he had it all, he had the text of his uh, Melchizedek blessing on his phone. And I dedicate this grave uh, with the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood, which I hold. I mean, nothing looked more ridiculous than that guy uh, reading his phone at the grave. But people get zealous over the name Jehovah, right? They can get zealous over only worshiping on the seventh day, on Saturday. They can get zealous over calling upon the Virgin Mary for some special help. They get zealous about making sure they were baptized by the right uh, elder in some particular church. Water baptism can never wash away the sin in your heart. Those things aren't related to God's righteous salvation or God's righteous standard. And that standard is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul writes about some people, he says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, 5. The real power of godliness rests in the person of Jesus Christ. They had zeal without knowledge. Also, they were ignorant of it on purpose. 
verse 2 says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. People don't stay home from church because they don't realize uh, the wonderful things we're saying and preaching here. And oh, if they only knew, they'd be here. They stay away because they do know what we're talking about. It's the same reason someone refuses a gospel track if you offer one to them. They're not scared of what's in it. They know what's in it. They're not interested in it. Too many people are willingly ignorant of God's standard and his righteous salvation. If I don't know about it, then I can't be held accountable for it. Seems to be their attitude. The Bible says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But pleading ignorance uh, of God's righteous standard, and of course that standard is Christ, won't excuse you on the day of judgment. Um, if you run a traffic light, you can't tell the police officer or the highway patrolman, I didn't see the light. You're going to get a ticket anyway because you could have seen it if you'd been looking. You could have seen it if you'd been looking. And if you wanted to know what God's standard of righteousness is and what you have to attain to and how you have to measure up in order to get to heaven, then it behooves you to get your nose in the Bible or read a good gospel track or, or consult with some Christian who believes these things and can tell you how to be saved. But being ignorant on purpose is a mistake. And people are often ignorant because they want to be ignorant. Go figure. I have no idea why that would be their, their logic, but it seems to be. Third thing they did wrong was not only did Israel have zeal without knowledge, not only were they ignorant of God's standard on purpose, but they tried to establish their own righteousness instead. I don't need God. I'm good enough on my own. In this respect, the Jews of Paul's day were no different than, the, than men and women today in the world. I'm a pretty good person, and I think God will recognize that. When I stand before him, uh, I think my church is leading me to the right place. You know, a loving God would never send someone to hell, would he? And um, that's just your opinion. You know, I have my own beliefs. That becomes a very subjective argument, way of rejecting it. I think you should let your conscience be your guide and everything will work out fine and so forth. Some people's consciences, the Bible says, are seared with a hot iron. Uh, it no longer prompts their thinking and provokes them when they do wrong. You know, your conscience can tell you when you've done wrong, but it can't prevent you from doing wrong. It only activates after you've done the wrong, right? It's a pretty feeble thing to trust in. The prophet Isaiah warned centuries before, that we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah 64, verse 6. And despite that admonition, Paul says they were still trying to put up their goodness, their righteousness, alongside the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. How foolhardy could someone be? Everybody thinks the other guy, he deserves hell. He deserves judgment, but not me. It's always the other guy. The theme song in hell being sung by Frank Sinatra today is, I did it my way. That's how you get to hell, doing it your way. Rejecting the way God has provided. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. Alongside the sinless, the spotless, the flawless, the, the peerless perfection of Jesus Christ, no man can measure up. No man can measure up. He alone is the definition, the perfect example of God's righteousness. And lastly, we'll, we'll finish with this last point. Not only was Israel trying to establish their own righteousness, but they had not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. This was like being ignorant on purpose. They were knowingly refusing the standard that God uh, could accept. 
it's one thing to admit to yourself that I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. There's something uh, wrong inside of me that wants to rebel against God. I can't save myself. It's one thing to admit that. It's another to then reject the one who can save you. That's got to be the biggest mistake ever made by, by men in the world. Admitting that you can't do it, but then rejecting the one who can. You know, a guy in the water who can't swim has two decisions he has to make. Number one, he has to stop flailing around and fighting against it. And number two, grab hold of that float or that lifeguard who's there to save him. When a sinner is persuaded that his own deeds, his own reputation, his own religious life, his own talents, his own charity, his, his uh, winning smile and his great personality are not sufficient to get him into heaven, then he has to embrace the one whose image was sinless and spotless and undefiled and without blemish, who is able to save. That's the perfection I can accept, God says. That's what I'm talking about, God says. And notice verse 4. It says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Not the end of the law, period, but as a means of establishing righteousness before God to everyone that believeth. The Jews made the same mistake that men make today. John 1.17 tells us, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The thing that was limited was then replaced by something much better in the coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. The Apostle Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. In Jesus Christ, Salvation doesn't flow because of your good works or your good deeds. But good works should flow from you because of your salvation. It's just the opposite of what the world wants to think. It's just the opposite of what the Jews thought. This is what Paul means when he said that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. He said earlier in chapter 4, Verse 6, you needn't turn. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's the condition I'm in. I have the righteousness of Christ imputed to me apart from anything I could have ever done to justify it or earn it. And if you've been saved and born again, so do you. If you know that God's saved you by imputing his righteousness to you apart from any good deeds on your part. Say amen. amen. That's pretty feeble. But, <laughs> but, but you and I stand in that position where God has saved us. He's cleansed, us, or cleansed our soul from any stain of sin. He's written our name in heaven, the Lamb's Book of Life. And he promises to grant us new bodies when, this, when these bodies are worn out. The Bible says, God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 6. That's right now. There's part of me that's already in the third heaven. So when I talk to God, it doesn't take uh, 10,000 light years for my prayer to tra traverse from here to the third heaven, wherever that may be. Part of me is there now. It's hard to wrap your mind around that, but it's nevertheless true because the Bible says it's so. God did all of that by a simple act of faith. When I understood I was a sinner and knew that I didn't want to go to hell for my sins, God saved me. And I said, God, forgive me. Wash me clean from my sin. Crying my eyes out as a little boy and God saved my soul. It's the most fantastic experience of my life. It's the most memorable experience of my early childhood, the day I was born again. And I've said it so often, most of you could probably tell me the date yourselves. I won't ask you to do so. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the model. He is the perfect standard of God's righteous salvation. And I'm going to close right here. The Bible says, uh, And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. I'm glad that I know him. I'm glad that he saved me. I'm glad that he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm glad that there's a mansion in New Jerusalem waiting for me. I'm glad that the blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. I'm glad that I can go to him anytime, day or night, and plead that blood once again to restore fellowship between me and God.